Take your Bibles this morning. Turn with me to the book of Matthew in chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, as we continue to follow the Matthew's account of the life and times of the Lord Jesus Christ, shall we say. In chapter 16, and this morning we'll be looking at verses 1 through 4. As we read them, I want, to, want you to pay close attention. Give some thought to what's being said. Verse 1. The Pharisees, also with the Sadducees, came and tempting, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O oh, ye hypocrites! Ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. In this passage of Scripture, we have Jesus again conversing with the Pharisees. But notice the partners with the Pharisees. It's usually mentioned the Pharisees and the scribes, the scribes and the Pharisees. But this morning passage, the Sadducees are with the Pharisees. What a peculiar alliance. What a peculiar alliance. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were normally at odds with one another. They were normally in disagreement with one another. The Sadducees said concerning the Pharisees that they wrote the names of their rulers together with the name of Moses in their writings of divorcement. I mean, you, you got to understand where, where the Pharisees were with Moses. They, they held Moses up here. And the Sadducees too. And you're, you're putting your, the names of your rulers in the same document, divorce documents, as the name of Moses. Well, and the Pharisees can said concerning the Sadducees that they wrote on the same leaf, the same page in a book, 
the names of their rulers with the name of God. You see, they were at odds with one another. And this was just a couple examples. There are many examples. One, one of the examples is concerning the resurrection. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection, as did Job, by the way. Yes. Job was waiting for the coming of the Lord. Yes. Job chapter 19, verse 25. Job knew Job was persuaded <laughs> that though they laid his body in the grave, that yet one day in his flesh, he was going to see Jesus. Amen. But the Sadducees, they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in spirits. I don't know what they did with Samuel and Saul. Yeah, yeah. I uh, had a instructor years ago implant that on my mind as a child how to remember they were sad you see because they didn't believe in the resurrection sad you see if you turn with me to the book of Acts and Acts in chapter 23 you look with me here we have an account of Paul using their their unequal alliances against them in chapter 23 and verse 7 and when he had so said there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the multitude was divided for the Sadducees say there that there is no resurrection neither angels nor spirits but the Pharisees confessed both Pharisees believed in angels, they believed in spirits, they believed in the resurrection. Sadducees didn't. But here we find them coming together, coming together to tempt the Lord. You see, they couldn't find any alliance, any agreement in, in the regular teachings. But they could in their alliance against Christ. You see, the Pharisees, he reproved of their tyranny, of their pride, and their hypocrisy. And the, the Sadducees, <laughs> Jesus by his teachings overthrew the heresy of the Sadducees who denied spirits and denied the resurrection. And Jesus taught both. Jesus taught the angels. And so, to both groups, the teachings and and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ was a reproof, yes. was a rebuke to them. And he calls them both <laughs> hypocrites. Yes. They were both great pretenders. Pretenders to be so religious but yet their heart was so far away from God. The first thing we want to note in this passage of Scripture is the demand and the purpose. The demand and the purpose, which is in verse 1. So notice the request. They said they wanted a sign from heaven. Pretending they would be satisfied, they would be convinced if they were given a sign from heaven. 
Well, what they wanted was some other sign than what they had already received. There had been given many signs to them. His doctrine, for one. His teaching, for one. And the mighty works which he did all testified of his messiahship. All testified that he was the one sent from God, come from God. Turn with me to the book of John. The book of John in chapter 10. And look with me here at verse 25. We read, Jesus answered them, that is, those, those old uh, scribes and Pharisees, those those Jews that stood against him and, and always looking for something to stone him for, a reason. And he answered them and he says, I told you and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. The works that I do, they bear witness that I am come from God. Amen. Look what he said on down here in in verse 34, Jesus answered them again. Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? If he called them gods unto whom he, the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, notice, of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, Thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. If I do the works of my Father, if I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. In other words, if the works that I do don't attest that I've come from the Father, then don't believe me. Amen. But... If I do the works of my Father, though ye believe me not, <laughs> believe the works that ye may know, and believe that the Father is in me, and I in him. You believe my works, that which I do. They testify of whether I'm come from the Father or not. They didn't want to believe him. They denied him. They despised his teaching. For it reproved them and showed them to be hypocrites. Showed them not to be really possessing of an inward change. They were all about the exterior. But inwardly, they were ravening wolves. They despised his works, which relieved the sick. Pay attention to that. They despised his works, which, which relieved the sick and the, and, and the disease of, of their miseries. Was that not a good work? I, he, I mean, he healed them. He possessed power to heal. He possessed power to cast out the de demons. To make them whole. But those Pharisees, they prayed. They prayed boasting of themselves. They prayed not for the sick and afflicted. Why, those were, oh, those were disgusting people. They prayed for them. Look at me. I'm glad as I'm I'm glad I'm not as other men. That's the way they prayed. And they come to Jesus. The Pharisees and the Sadducees united together on their opposition against the Christ. And they said, We want a sign. We want a sign from heaven. Well, what were they asking for? They wanted a sign from heaven, meaning, 
meaning like the days of old, like the days of, of Moses. When from Mount Sinai, a voice thundered. When the mount was, was a smoke, it was on fire because God was there. Such as we read of in the book of Exodus in chapter 19, verse 16 and, and the verses following there. That's what they were looking for. They wanted a sign as in the days of Joshua when the sun stood still and refused to set until Joshua had had the victory. That's what they were looking for. They wanted, wanted something sensational to happen. You see, they were all about the senses. All about what they could see, what they could hear, what they could touch, what they could smell, what they could taste. Everything that they could be experienced by the senses. And so we have men and women today. It's all about feelings. It's all about what they can see. It's all about what they can touch. It's all about what they can, can hear and feel. Well, what was their purpose? What was their purpose in, in asking a sign, in demanding a sign? <laughs> they didn't really want a sign. They, they had many signs. They had many signs given of his Messiahship, of which they attributed to Beelzebub. They said, they said that which he did was, was by the spirit of Beelzebub. Turn with me back to the 12th chapter. Remember a, a few months ago when we looked at this 12th chapter, we, we dealt with that, that fact. That, but in verse 24, but when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow doth cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the dead. You see, that fellow that was brought to Jesus, he was blind, he was deaf, could not hear, and he could not speak. And Jesus healed his blindness, healed his deafness, and healed his speech, <laughs> so that he both spoke and heard and saw. And they said, why, well, he did that by Beelzebub, prince of the devils. He's a devil. He's in alliance with the devil. You see, they came, according to verse 1, they came tempting. They came trying to tempt Christ to ensnare him. As did their forefathers. Tempted. Turn with me to the book of Psalms in, in chapter 78. The book of Psalms in, in, in chapter 78. And here we have the blessed uh, psalmist uh, writing concerning the forefathers in the wilderness. In chapter 78, in verse 18... He says, he says this, And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? We have reference made to this very thing. In fact, what is being talked about here in Psalm 78 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is what we find back in the book of Numbers in chapter 21 and verses 4 through 6 when, 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 they, when they came and, and there was nothing to eat, nothing to drink, and they tempted the Lord God, complaining and murmuring, can God set a table in the wilderness? And he sent the fiery serpents. 
1 Corinthians chapter 10. The Spirit of God says to us here, to you and I, today, he says, he, he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 9. He said, neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. You see, many times we forget about the power of God. We forget about the power of the Creator. We tempt Him by our lack of distrust, our lack of unbelief in Him, just as the forefathers of these Pharisees and Sadducees did. And they came, these Pharisees and Sadducees came tempting Jesus just like their forefathers did. See, even though that was thousands of years before, yet they were just like them. Well, second thing we want to know is Christ's answer. Christ's answer. Jesus replies to their folly. He replies to their foolishness. And because it was foolishness, because it was folly, it was a blind man. I mean, <laughs> the signs were there. With wisdom, he replied. In the book of Proverbs, in, in chapter 26, and in verse 5, it tells us to answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Actually, what that, that, that is saying to us is, is speak to a fool in wisdom. Yeah. Speak to a fool in wisdom, which will expose his folly... And he'll not be able to be lifted, exalted with pride, thinking he's wise. <laughs> you see, and so Jesus spoke to him in wisdom, which, which his wisdom exposed their folly, exposed their foolishness. Yes. Amen. So they were not be able to be exalted, to be lifted with pride. He says in essence in verses 2 and 3 that their discernment, their discernment was limited. They were seeking for signs, for signs of the Messiah and his kingdom when he was standing right before them. He was standing right before their eyes. Hmm. Well, they were no different than their forefathers. Their forefathers, it said in the book of Exodus, chapter 17 and, and verse 7, boy, just not long after crossing, crossing the Red Sea, and that great victory over the Egyptian army that God wrought. I mean, the Israelites didn't even lift a hand. God destroyed the Egyptian army in the Red Sea. Amen. When, they, when they followed Israel, and God closed up the waters upon them. And the Israelites arose the next morning and dead corpses laying all over the seashore. And the Egyptian army. He made the water sweet at the hole of bitter waters. In the 17th chapter of Exodus, in cha verse 7, and, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? This is in reference to, to Moses standing on the rock. And striking a rock and water gushing forth. 
And what, what, did, what did Moses say? What did God say that the children of Israel were guilty of? They said, is the Lord among us or not? In other words, what they were saying, the Lord's not even among us. Where's he at? Here we are. We're going to die of thirst. They bought, brought us out here to die. Well, <laughs> these Pharisees and Sadducees had Jesus, the Son of God, the God-man in the flesh, standing right before them manifesting by the, his teachings and by the many mighty works that he did. Amen. That he was the Son of God. They were, that is, these Pharisees and Sadducees were, were skilled and, and quick to discern the weather and to be able to forecast it. Boy, are, are we skilled? We can, we can tell when the hurricane is, is weeks away, a week away from us. We can tell with some kind of certainty, a little bit of certainty, when it's going to hit us. Or whether it's going to hit us at all. Yes. What do we need of God? Job, chapter 37, verse 16, Elihu said this in extolling God. He said, Dost thou know the balancings of the clouds, the wondrous works of him which is perfect in knowledge? Those, those clouds that you look at, the sky that you look at, and you see that it's red in the evening. Oh, it's going to be fair weather tonight. Or you see it's red in the morning in the east. Oh, it's going to be bad weather today. Do you know who created that? Do you know the one that holds them in his hand, balances them in his hand? And, it, and he balances them along till he wants it to drop the rain. Right. Isaiah, turn with me to the book of Isaiah. Chapter 47, Isaiah. We're told this in the book of Isaiah. In, verse, in chapter 47, in verse 13. Here's the charge, and it's a charge against us today. He says, Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Oh, we have many counselors today. We have many counsel, many that we run to for counsel. That's what he's saying. Let now, let now the astrologers. Think about these that he names here. The astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators, stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. Let all those counselors, the astrologers and the stargazers and the monthly prognosticators, let, let them deliver you from the wrath of God which is to come upon you. You see what these Pharisees and Sadducees were able to do? They were able to tell the weather. Big deal. Who sent the weather? Yes, amen. Whose hand is the weather in control? Listen, 
Yes, God has allowed us to increase much in knowledge today, and we have all these instruments, and we can detect a hurricane way out there, a week and a half, week and a half away, ten days away, and we can we can tell that it's coming this way, and the, the wind currents and everything are favorable. It's going to come right in here, and boy, it's going to come right up the east coast here, and then all of a sudden God turns. Oh well, well it's coming over here to the west now. Oh well, it's comes right up the middle of the state. You see? Who did that? God did. They were extremely dull, he said. And then what he said in, in verse 3? But can ye not discern the signs of the times? You see, they could discern things of the world. The things which they could see, they could experience with their senses. But they had no insight, no discernment into the word of God, right? Right? They were extremely dull in the care and regard of their souls. Can you not see that the Messiah has come? Can you not see that He's here? That He's living amongst men? If they were the great teachers that they thought themselves to be, they should have known by Daniel's weeks. That it was time for the Messiah. Sixty-nine weeks from the which sixty-nine sevens. Sixty-nine times seven years. From the time of the proclamation to restore the city to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. It was that 69th week. Christ was there. Christ was standing before them. They were not able to discern that. Daniel's weeks are found in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. There's one week remaining. One week of seven years remaining. <laughs> That's the 70th week. That's the week of great tribulation. Pharisees and Sadducees. Pharisees and Sadducees amongst us today. Do you not see your own destruction is coming? Your destruction for rejecting the Christ? You will not heed his words? You will not heed the good news that the Savior has come? And therefore you will die in your sins? what he said in the book of John chapter 8 in verse 24 he said I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins for ye, if ye believe not that I am he ye shall die in your sins Amen. 
In essence, that's what he was telling these Pharisees and Sadducees. If you believe not, if you reject me, if you reject the Christ, you'll die in your sins. And so, he points out the fallacy of their being able to discern the weather, but not being able to discern the Word of God, not being able to discern the Christ, the Messiah, who was standing right in front of them, the one whom they conversed with, the one whom they sought to tempt, to ensnare, to trap. He says in verse 4, there shall no sign be given. Look at how he says it. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. In other words, you are a wicked and an adulterous generation. And how many wicked and adulterous generations have there been since that generation? How many wicked and adulterous generations had there been up to the time of that wicked and adulterous generation? And how many wicked and adulterous generations have there been since? And that wicked and adulterous generation, each and every one of them, seek a sign. And there shall no sign be given unto it. But the sign of the prophet Jonas. There shall no sign be given. Just as he said before in, in the book of Matthew, chapter 12 and verse 39, there shall no sign be given. He used almost the exact same word. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, but there shall no sign be given it. Except. There's one remaining sign. You look to that sign. They are an adulterous generation. They have sought out their own devices, and they had did that which pleased themselves. Boy, that sounds so familiar to me. Which is idolatry. And said, I have done nothing wrong. Is that not what the harlot says? Turn with me to the book of Proverbs. Turn with me to the book of Proverbs in chapter 30. In verse 20. Such is the way of an harlot, of an adulterous woman. She eateth and wipeth her mouth and saith, I have done no wickedness. In other words, she eateth of all her uh, 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 desires, her adulterous ways, wipes her mouth of it and says, I've done no wrong. That's what Jesus was charging, charging this adulterate, wicked and adulterous generation on. They'd done no, they, they said they had done no wrong. Think about his refusal. They sought to catch him in a pit. But he turned them into it themselves. Yeah. Isn't that what the book of Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 27 tells us? Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth a stone, it will return un, un, upon him. He that digs a pit to ensnare another man, he's going to fall in it himself. Or he that rolls a stone to roll it on a man, it's going to return on him. Jesus just turned it around on these 
Pharisees and Sadducees and refused to give them any further proof. In the book of Luke, chapter 16, we have a somber setting here. Remember the rich man? Remember Lazarus, the beggar? They both died. And the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell, being in torment. Amen. And as it progressed on, he wanted a drop of water to cool the torments upon his tongue. He eventually wanted that one, that, that God would send one back from the dead to, to talk to his brethren, to warn his brethren that they come not to this place. And here was the response in verse 31. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses, and the prophets. Neither will they be persuaded the one rose from the dead. And one has risen from the dead. And they believe him not. We have the record of God's word right here before us. Amen. Moses and the prophets. And testifying of the one who is rose from the dead. And they believed him not. He refers them to the one, one sign. The, the final sign. Not only his teachings testified of who he was, not only his works testified of who he was, but this sign here will testify of who he is. The sign of Jonas. What's the sign of Jonah? Well, in chapter 1 and verse 17, remember Jonah is, is told to go preach to the wicked city Nineveh that they might repent and, and believe God. And and why Jonah didn't want to go there, that was his enemies. He was a good Israelite. They were Syrians. He didn't want to go to his enemies and preach to his enemies, so he's, he's running as far away from that situation as he can go and found out he can't outrun God. God had a great fish prepared for him. Swallowed him up, and verse 17 of, of that first chapter tells us, And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, and that is the sign of Jonah. Amen. According to the book of Luke chapter 11 and verse 30, For as Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale three nights and three days, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights, and then what? He's going to come forth. Amen. And what's that going to do? That's going to give proof that he is God. Amen. He's creator of this vast universe. He's creator of all men. He, he holds the power of life and death in his hand. You see, when Jesus said this to these Pharisees and Sadducees, it was yet future. <laughs> but don't you think some of those Pharisees and Sadducees 
When Jesus came forth from the grave, they thought about that. They thought about, they knew well what the sign of Jonah was. You see, when they saw the Son of Man, three days and three nights in the earth, in the grave, and then they saw him coming forth. That was the last remaining sign that he, Jesus Christ, was the God man. And they still believed not. And there are still hundreds of thousands today that believe not. Our verse closes with, Then he forsook them and left that place. What did he do? The same thing that he told his apostles to do. If they not receive you, Shake the dust off his feet. And he left them. He shook the dust off their feet. My friend, you've been permitted one more time to be given a glimpse, to be given a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe him? Do you accept him? Do you receive him? If not, this may be the last time. He may shake the dust off his feet, never to have it presented to you again. Shall we stand, have a song in closing?